I'm Jonathan Tompkin from the University of Illinois. In this lecture, we're going to talk about genetically modified organisms and the precautionary principle. Genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, might be the green revolution future. People have been altering the genetic makeup of plants and animals for thousands of years, generally through selective breeding. We've done this to increase cereal production or to increase milk production from cows, and almost every single modern agricultural plant or animal is in fact the product of thousands of years of interference by humans. One example of this is teosinte, a grass native to North America. Through selective breeding, teosinte, or grasses very much like it, have been transformed into modern corn. And as you can see from this picture, it's hard to believe that the two were ever related. Not all breeding is so natural, however. In the 20th century, radiation was used to induce mutations to increase the rate at which genetic selection can happen. And since then, we've got an even more precise technique. Genetic modified organisms, or GMOs, are similarly changed, but they're defined as organisms that have been altered using genetic engineering techniques. So sometimes that means that you could bring in genes from uh, a different species altogether, so you don't need to do standard breeding techniques. I would point out that standard breeding techniques are not so standard. And for example, in the past, have included, included things like using radiation to induce mutations. So there is a difference, but the difference is smaller than you might expect compared to what we've been using and what's produced the food crops that have fed most of humanity up to near the end of the 20th century. Just as an aside, GMOs have extended beyond agriculture. Glowfish, a fluorescent fish used as a pet, are the first genetically engineered fish. And in this case, a zebrafish has had genetic material from a jellyfish added to make it fluoresce. This perhaps points to what might be considered wrong with GM food. Is it moral to change uh, an organism's genetics in this way. And another thing, of course, is that the glowfish is owned by a company, Yorktown Technologies. Is it all right to confer private ownership of genetic material? Similarly, it's often thought to be capitalistic and bad for small farmers or small producers. To be a GM company, you have to be big to support all the research and development. Other worries include genetic pollution, if we introduce genes that make a plant resistant to pesticides, for example, then what if that spreads to weeds? Other complaints are very similar to the problems that we might see with the original Green Revolution. For example, it furthers monocultures. 90% of the corn grown in the county in which I live is the same genetically modified brand of Monsanto Roundup Ready corn. So we have a large monoculture uh, in this region of the world. Other complaints have addressed the use of pesticides or herbicides that are often associated with genetically modified foods. Some have even worried that they threaten human health. To judge whether or not we should use a technology, some have argued that we should use what's known as the precautionary principle. This is the definition from Wikipedia. The precautionary principle says that if an action or policy has suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, in the absence of a scientific consensus that harm would not ensue, the burden of proof falls on those who would advocate taking the action. So in other words, unless you can prove that this new technology, say GM food, is safe, you should not be allowed to use it because there is the risk of danger. Something bad might happen. I'd like to illustrate this by going through a small decision tree. We have a question, should we adopt a new technology? And of course, we can always either say yes or we can say no. What happens when we say yes? Well, there's two possibilities. It could be a positive outcome. We could have the foreseen advantages of the new technology. So for example, for a food crop, that might be increased yields. Um, and that's the expected positive result. However, we can also see a negative possible impact. So for example, that might be uh, the spreading of um, genetic material to weed crops and so thereby um, causing damage to an ecosystem. So we could either get a help or we could get a harm from adopting a new technology. Sometimes we get a mixture of both, of course. What if we say no? Well, if we say no, it doesn't matter if there are unforeseen 
negative uh, effects from this technology. Similarly, it doesn't matter how useful the technology might be. In both cases, nothing changes because we never adopted the technology. Theoretically, then, the precautionary principle means that, at worst, only good things can happen since we only adopt a new technology if science says it's perfectly safe. In other words, that part of the decision tree where a harm could occur doesn't exist. So we either adopt things and it's good, or we don't adopt them and avoid anything that's bad. In practice, however, scientists, just like everybody else, are never 100% sure about anything. And if we always applied a strong version of the precautionary principle, we would never adopt a new technology. And of course, the fact that I'm talking to you um, through the internet, with the power which is powered by electricity, and so on and so forth, these are all new technologies that were adopted, despite the fact that they were not proven safe at the time, and in fact are not proven safe today. So in its strongest form, the precautionary principle is paralyzing and prevents development. Since we see many places around the world today that require further development, even our own, we might say that a very strong form of the precautionary principle is in itself immoral. Furthermore, these strong forms of the precautionary principle don't weigh costs and benefits. And when we live our own lives, we tend to do that. We do take risks, but we judge them against the potential benefit of an action. So for example, if I was using the strong form of the precautionary principle, I might never cross the street because of the risk of getting struck by a car. But my need to, to move to get to somewhere else outweighs that. The benefit of me walking across the street is greater than the risk of the crossing of the road. And don't forget that not doing anything, that is the inaction, can itself be a harm. Take, for example, the introduction of a new drug. If we too strongly apply a precautionary principle, we would very rarely adopt new drugs. And so that means that people would unnecessarily be harmed, die or grow sick, if that drug was indeed useful. So if we delay the introduction of new technologies unnecessarily, we're also creating a harm. On the plus side, the principle does keep us humble and reminds us that we don't know all the consequences of our actions. A good example of this might be geoengineering. We don't fully understand the climate system, and so, unless we're, and so using a principle like the precautionary principle, we might be able to avoid creating bigger harms um, than the benefits that we're pursuing. In my view, best practice environmental policy involves weighing costs and benefits, and so using the precautionary principle can be overly conservative. We'll talk more about environmental policy next week. All right, so we've talked about the precautionary principle, and that can apply to lots of environmental policies. What about genetically modified organisms? Well, as far as scientists can tell, GM foods are not bad for people. If I can read some quotes. The European Commission, Directorate General for Research and Innovation in 2010, reports on, reported on GMOs and noted that the main conclusion to be drawn from the efforts of more than 130 research projects, covering a period of more than 25 years of research and involving more than 500 independent researchers, is that bi biotechnology, and in particular GMOs, are not per se more risky than traditional breeding technologies. Other reviews, for example a 2008 review by the Society of Medicine, noted that GM foods have been eaten by millions of people for over 15 years with no noted ill effects. And similarly a 2004 report from the US National Academy of Science stated, to date, no adverse health effects attributed to genetic engineering have been documented in the human population. Now, this doesn't mean that there might not be other negative effects. For example, if you're worried about monocultures, clearly the introduction of GM foods have in some places increased uh, monocultured crops. Similarly, it's changed the patterns of pesticide and fertilizer use. And there's the additional danger, of course, of things like genetic drift, where these genetic resistances to, say, herbicide gets passed on to weeds. You should be aware, though, that if you live in the United States, the majority of processed food and meat contains GMO. GMO is widespread. The vast majority of people taking this class have consumed GMO foods at some point. As you can see from this graph, it's allowed in most places around the world. The top producers of GM foods are in North America, South America and China. These are some of the world's biggest producers of food for export. And the trend in these countries 
has to see an increase in the percentage of the crop that is in some way gen genetically modified. So, for example, they might be herbicide resistant or contain pesticides. We see this particularly in North America, which has been very quick to use genetically modified foods relative to some other places around the world. GM foods have another potential advantage. When farmers till the land to kill weeds, they expose topsoil to the elements, to wind and rain, and over the last couple of centuries there's been a marked loss of topsoil. Topsoil is in principle a renewable resource. It's made from the bedrock beneath the ground, but if it's stripped away too quickly, we could reach that bedrock and prevent that regeneration. GM crops require less tilling because you can spray herbicides directly on the crop. It doesn't hurt it because it's um, genetically protected from that. And so because farmers no longer have to till, there's been a reduction in many places around the world in the rate of topsoil loss. We appear to be on some kind of a treadmill. Our current population and our current forms of our societies require very high yields from our agricultural production to be sustainable. Yields before the Green Revolution were around one-tenth of what they are today. So if we didn't have the Green Revolution, we'd need ten times as much farmland. That farmland doesn't exist. So to feed the seven billion people of today, let alone the nine billion of 2050, we need to use technology to enhance yields. We live in a world of finite resources, so we can't afford to make too many mistakes. How can we be sure that we're using the best technologies and the best policies to protect the environment? We'll find out next week. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.